So I'll go on to the next slide. Exactly as our Swamiji told us, I have a very small uh, extract from Mankuti Manakaga, which is known as the Bhagavad Gita in Canada, uh, which says, Hosa Chiguru Hale Beru Kudi Lalu Mara Sogasu, Hosa Yukti Hale Tatva Doda Gude Dharma, Rushi Vatkiya Dodane Vignana Kale Mela Vise, Jasa Ujivanake Mankuti Ma. That's precisely what Swamiji also thought of a quote saying that we had a lot of information in this country from our Rishis, and there is also a new science which is uh, blossoming in this country, which has blossomed also to a large extent. And if both of them come together, it gives you a benefit, and a great benefit to humanity. So thank you, sir, for having given me an opportunity to share with this thought with you and also to go on with my talk. Thank you very much. I will just start my presentation. Well, I look at, as uh, Atul just now said, this entire arrangement as a celebration of science. And I intend to showcase science and technology of cosmology in the spirit of a science festival and share with you the kind of adventures that this science of cosmology led me to along with my colleagues at the Raman Research Institute. So that's why my talk is titled Adventures in Cosmology from Ground, Water and Space. Well, let me start with a definition of what is cosmology. How the universe came into being, why it looks as it does now, and what the future holds is a very important aspect of cosmology. Another important part of it is to make astronomical observations to probe billions of years into the past, almost to the edge of the universe. Having made observations, we seek the basis of scientific understanding using the tools of modern physics. And also, having understood scientifically what our observations may mean, we fashion theories that provide unified and testable models of the evolution of the universe from its birth to the present and possibly what may happen into the future. So it is the birth, evolution, and the future of the universe is basically what cosmology is all about. Well, we are the first generation of human beings to glimpse the full sweep of cosmic history, starting from the universe's fairy origin in the Big Bang to the silent, stately, stately flight of galaxies through the intergalactic medium. Humankind continues its own journey into the future with a new depth of understanding and appreciation for the forces that shape our destiny and the destiny of the entire universe, observable universe. Well, we know today that the universe began with a big bang, but almost with a history of 13.7 billion years. When it began, it was a, 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 a plasma, which was very, very hot, and only what existed in the universe was the radiation. It, was, it took almost 400 million years from the birth of the universe for the stars and the nascent galaxies to form. And almost for one billion years or so, it was dark ages. And it dark ages ends around the billion year. And it was only compared to 13.7 billion years, it was only 9.2 billion years the sun, earth and solar system got formed. And this is where we are today. Today, we have understood that the entire universe is no more made up of what we thought earlier. Even 50 years back, perhaps we thought, what is the normal matter is the complete universe. No, we have now understood that the normal matter is only 4% of this entire universe. And the 23% of the universe is dominated by dark matter and dark energy permeates almost 73% of this universe. 
Well, that is a very simplified and overall few aspects related to the uh, the cosmos of the universe. But we did not have this feeling of what the universe was even in 1900. If you just look at briefly a history of cosmology, in the ancient era, we thought the universe only extended up to 10 to the power of 8 kilometers with only an age of 10 to the power of 4 years. It was even in 1900, a century before, we thought the size of the universe was 10 to the power of 17 kilometer and with the age of the universe being infinite, sort of universe existed all along. It's only now that we have started appreciating that the universe is as old as 13.7 billion years. We came to this understanding by asking several questions. I won't go into the details of questions and how the answers were arrived at, but I will briefly point to you the questions and the answers only. I suggest that you go back, go to the Google God at home. You can Google each one of these questions that I have put up here and study for yourself how the cosmology, how the, our present understanding of the universe evolved. The first big question that asked was, is Earth or at the sun at the center of this universe? This is what we call as, uh, in the early days, we had an Earth-centered cosmology in the era of Ptolemy between 100 to 170 AD. Whereas even in the time of Galileo, during 1594 to 1642, Galileo's championing of heliocentrism, that is, uh, saying that the sun was at the center, was controversial of the, of the solar system, was controversial within his lifetime. When most subscribed to either geocentrism, he met with very stiff opposition from astronomers who doubted heliocentrism due to the absence of an observed stellar parallax. Most of us know that stellar parallax is a method of measuring, one of the methods of measuring the distance to the stars. So the next big question that came up to the astronomers are how far away are these stars? We had to wait up to 1838 when Bessel using the telescope at the Koningsberg Observatory measured the, the distance to the stars. And we all know today that the closest star to our solar system is Proxima Centauri which is about 4.24 light years away. That means if a cricket match is being played on that star today, we will be able to receive it only after four years on our televisions. So that's what it means to be that the nearest star to the solar system, Proxima Centauri, is about 4.24 light years. Then once we understood that there is a solar system and the stars around us, the next big question was, what are these stars made up of? Of course, people found out that stars are made up of very hot gas containing mostly hydrogen and helium, and stars shine by burning hydrogen into helium in their cores and later in their lives create heavier elements. Well, therefore, we confirmed around 1863 that the sun is like other stars, or the other stars are like suns. Then the next question question came, where is the sun in our galaxy? This is, leads us to a great debate between Shapley and Curtis, which took almost exactly 100 years before. And is the solar system at the center of the galaxy? was a very big question that existed at the time. And Shapley and Curtis had actually a, a, an open debate about their observations and what it indicates. Well, that debate and subsequent developments in astronomy led to the fact that the solar system is near the edge of the galaxy and it's about 100,000 light years across. So imagine where we have come from. We thought the universe was very small, almost to the level of only a solar system. Then we felt, all right, the nearest star is about a four light years. And now we have come to the fact that we, the solar system and the Earth, uh, the entire sun, is not at the center of our own galaxy, but it is at one edge with about 100,000 light years across is the kind of uh, uh, scales that we are talking about, about. Then the next big question that came up is, is it one galaxy or many? Now we know that Milky Way is not unique and we live in a universe of a large number of galaxies, 10 to the power of 11 galaxies. 
This is a, a picture taken by the Hubble telescope, a Hubble deep field, which reveals a universe full of galaxies. So billions of stars in galaxies, and almost, as I said, we have 10 to the power of 11 galaxies in this universe. Then the next question that came up is, oh my God, did this universe have a beginning? The, it was the Edwin Hubble, that's why the telescope is named as the Hubble Space Telescope. It was Edwin Hubble's data that showed that more distant galaxies are moving away faster than the galaxies which are close to us. What he did by his observations is to plot the velocity and the distance of these galaxies, the velocity with which it were moving away. And he used the simpler physics, simple physics of Doppler effect to find out what is the kind of velocities with which they are moving away from us. He found that it could be fitted with a linear relation with the form the velocity is equal to a constant into the distance, consistent with a homogeneous and isotropic expansion of the universe. And this constant, just like many other constants, you know, the gravitational constant G, which describes or which quantifies the force of attraction between two objects in space, the expansion parameter H0, which is relates the velocity to the distance of the galaxies, uh, was named as Hubble constant. Remember how science progresses. Hubble himself calculated it to be 500 kilometers per second per 10 to the power of 6 parsecs. One parsec is approximately 3.2 light years. So million, so 3.2 million light years. So he thought if a galaxy was at 3.2 million light years away, it moved away from us at 500 kilometers per second. But look at what we have found out in 2016. We found by a tremendous number of experiments and observations that the Hubble constant is only 72 approximately in that ballpark, 72 plus or minus 8, or 73.24. Uh, so that was what was uh, found by the Hubble Space Telescope in 2016. The number gets uh, refined and refined, and there are fantastic amounts of progress that keeps happening in all these fields. But we have now come down from 500 kilometers, as Hubble thought it was, to 72 kilometers in a ballpark of 70 kilometers per second. It is this velocity of with which the galaxies are moving away from us, its estimation gave us the age of the universe. If you play a cassette which shows you the expansion of the universe in its rewind mode and look at it, what it looks like, when do you think the Hubble or the Big Bang happened? And that is approximately equal to one by the age of the universe. So using this constant, the Hubble constant, which is now uh, uh, I mean, sort of 70, around the ballpark of 70 kilometers per second per 3.2 million uh, light years, we have uh, found that the age of the universe to be 13.7 billion years. So this happened very, uh, you can see that this age was sort of known to us only in 2016. Of course, there were estimates uh, which are not so good, but uh, very much very close to this ballpark. But I'm just now showing to you that how cosmology has progressed in the last century. And now we have an understanding that the universe is as old as 13.7 billion years. What is the evidence that there is a Big Bang? So the evidence of the Big Bang was detected in 1965. It was actually made use of radio waves which are coming from the celestial sphere which was coming from the celestial sources in the sky. Well, it's very important at this time to point out, I have not gone into the details, I have not included any slides because it takes away a lot of time, just to tell you that when Galileo looked at the sky with his, with his telescope, it was a light chauvinistic society. That is, man observed the sky only with the optical light, that is, only what the eyes could see in the visible range. Whereas today, the astronomy has opened up and we can see and study the universe in all electromagnetic waves, the entire gamut of electromagnetic waves from radio to gamma ray, x-rays, and come to think of any electromagnetic wave, we have an astronomy which is going across it. So this evidence of Big Bang was detected by radio astronomy around 1965, when in 1964, Penzias and Bob Wilson 
discovered that some of the cosmic noise observed around 4 gigahertz using a Harlem antenna that is this is the Harlem antenna that it was in Hallmadel New Jersey this is the Hallmadel New Jersey antenna which they used and they found that there is an extra amount of signal coming from all over the space no matter in which direction if you 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 have a radiation which is coming and its temperature was estimated to be 3.5 degree Kelvin very similar to how do you know that the sun's temperature is 6,000 degrees? We know we use the, the means displacement law and it says that if an object is dominantly yellow in color, we find out lambda mt, we know, uh, temp, we know lambda m, so we calculate t because lambda mt is also equal to a constant. So similarly, they found that there was a radiation which was surrounded or we are surrounded by radiation coming in all different directions and it was coming at 3.5 degree K. Cosmology finally had an observational foothold, a measurable remnant of the early universe, a probe to test the various cosmological models. So that's the most important. When the universe began with the Big Bang, it was a very high temperature and the entire universe that was at that time was in plasma. But as the universe expanded, we know that the Hubble has showed that the universe expands. As the universe expanded, it cooled. So people had believed that, look, if this is indeed true, we should be submerged in a bath of a black body radiation. And here, 1964, the, uh, Penzias and Wilson discovered this, uh, an isotropic or, or a radiation which was coming from different directions, all directions in the sky. And that's why they won a Nobel Prize and they were awarded a Nobel Prize for their work. Subsequently, people have found that this cosmic microwave background, as it is known as, has a black body spectrum similar to that of the sun, but thousand times cooler. So once again, I repeat, the universe hot and dense when it was 400,000 years in age, the ancient optical light from that time traveled to us across space and its wavelength got stretched thousand times and they are observable now in radio waves at a wavelength of 0.1 centimeter, you will see where it picks out. I just want you to go home and find out what is this frequency in gigahertz. It will be interesting for you to find out. Once again, use the same uh, expression, means displacement not. You know lambda mt is a constant. So if lambda mt is 0.5 microns, t is about 6,000 angstroms. And at what radio wave this uh, cosmic microwave background peaks, is very interesting to calculate. Just go back and take this as a simple homework for you to do. Not only that, subsequently people showed that this cosmic microwave background is not just isotropic. It, yes, it comes from all directions in the sky, but it shows very slight variations in the intensity with the direction of the sky. It's actually the variation is one part in 10 to the power of 5. You imagine in 1965, we did not even know that the cosmic microwave background existed, but we measured it in 1965, and today we know how it varies in the sky to an accuracy of one part in 10 to the power of five. That's why we say today or now is the age of precision cosmology. We are being able to go to very precise measurements of the properties of the universe. And that is the triumph of cosmology, of science and technology both. Maybe this is a slightly, uh, yeah. So the cosmic radio noise, that is the cosmic microwave background, tells us, slides are taking, uh, the cosmic radio noise tells us that we live in an expanding universe. An expanding universe is also changing, changing from hot gas to one with atoms, stars, and galaxies. So you see, at the top corner, we have a 3.5 degree Kelvin approximately. That's the cosmic microwave background. And now we see uh, how these clumps in the cosmic or variations in intensity has given to a clumpy universe. We call this a Big Bang universe. So no more cosmologists favor a steady state universe as their model for this universe. So modern cosmology considers that galaxies like our Milky Way 
or the bricks that make our universe. So earlier we had solar system, we had stars, we had clusters of uh, stars, varieties of objects in the universe. But today we believe it's the galaxies that make up our universe. That is the one that builds our entire universe. And these Milky, our own Milky Way is surrounded by galaxies of various types. I will not go into all kinds of various types, but you can see them in the picture. There is a spiral galaxy, there is an elliptical galaxy, different types of galaxies. And these galaxies in the universe as a whole, they form clusters, filaments, and sheets. And they're not uniformly distributed because that's why they form clusters, filaments, sheets, surrounding many places where there are voids. We want to understand how galaxies form, why they are distributed in these patterns. And that has been the standpoint of the recent or more important uh, cosmology that we are dealing with in the last few decades. So we know today the universe we live in has atoms, stars and galaxies. And the question is, was the universe always the way it is today? How and when did atoms, stars, galaxies form? And why they are distributed in these patterns are some of the questions that people are interested about. Very fortunately, astronomers can see the history of the universe and also its evolution from its birth. Because light does not travel instantaneously. Speed of light is one foot in a billionth of a second or one foot in a nanosecond. So when you are seeing the sun, which is eight light minutes away, you are seeing the sun as it was eight minutes back. When I told you if a cricket match is being played in Proxima, uh, Proxima, that's our nearest star, we will only see that match four years later. That means what we are seeing today is a program that took place in 2016. So the nearest galaxy is 200,000 light years. Therefore, you will be seeing when you are looking at the galaxy, how the environment or how the pattern in the galaxy was 200,000 years back. And we have a 13.7 billion years and we can perhaps see all the way up to the edge of the universe. Whereas modern cosmology has advanced considerably, has made very precise measurements of the cosmic microwave background and its relationship to the large scale structures that I described. But still, we have only seen, see, look at the technology, so many space-based telescopes. We have telescopes all over the world in different parts of the Earth. Even all these data sets that we have has shown the distribution of matter and given us a feeling for only one thousandth of the universe. The, they yet only cover 0.1% of the entire co-moving volume of the observable universe. So this is the same thing, the existing data sets include an image of the universe when it was 0.4 million years old. The cosmic microwave background is 0.4 million years old. It is what came to us at the time the universe was that. And we also have the images of individual galaxies when the universe was much older than a billion years. So 0.4 million to a billion years, we have not seen at all. We don't have any observations of the universe in that epoch. Well, my friends, this is a basic introduction to cosmology. Now I'm coming to what is the adventure that me and my colleagues at the Raman Institute are doing. The project is called, I mean, it's called by different names, Aras and Pratush, but I'm just using one of those names is Pratush, probing reionization of the universe using signal from hydrogen. As I go along, I will explain to you what is the ionization? What is the signal from hydrogen atom? Both of them. Well, the adventure that I'm going to describe to you from now on is, so this is my team. Here is, uh, uh, well, uh, this is myself. Uh, this is our director, Ravi Subramania. And uh, we have Mayuri, who is right now in uh, Berkeley. And this is Vani, the, an, an engineer. And we have a very young student called Saurabh, who is now working in Canada. So, and, and, a good, and it's a very, perhaps there's a baby of the team who has just done his MSc who, when, we were take, when we took this picture. And we have other engineers and scientists from the Raman Institute. This is a small team of people who are building and looking at probing the reionization of the universe. 
we are interested, let me see if we say, yeah, we are interested in finding out uh, what happens when the first stars were born. So that's what we are interested in. So we look at what the first stars were born in the universe. How was the environment around the first stars which were born in the universe is the experiment that we are trying to do. Well, I want to tell you one thing. In the classroom, when you go to a laboratory, you have an experiment which is set up by your teacher. You are told what is the aim of the experiment. You conduct an experiment and you get a result and you go and show it to your teacher and he corrects it. No, this is right, this is wrong. But remember, when you are doing a, an experiment in research, that through the frontiers of science, nobody knows the answer. So I told you that we are trying to explore the age of the universe, not the age, I mean, the regime of the universe when the first stars were born, something like 400 million years. I'll just show you those plots again and again for you to get an impression of what it is. So therefore, we don't know the answer. And the entire excitement is about that fact that we don't know how the universe was, how, when did what, the things that happened, what is the evolution history during that, that time. We have understood in a whole sense how the universe began with the Big Bang and what we see, but there is a gap in the observation around the, the first stars were born in the universe, and that's what we are looking at. It's a very exciting uh, uh, science because not many people in the world have done it, and nor many pe few people in the world are attempting it. So what is this that I'm trying to do? The very early universe, as I told you, was very hot, was completely ionized. As it expanded and cooled down, it went through several stages of recombination, became neutral, and then it became opaque. It is around this period when approximately uh, the universe was 1, 000, 1 by 7,000th of its present size, the helium atoms and its ions got formed. And you find that by about the fact that when it was, the universe was, the redshift is 2,500, that means the, the radiation which is emitted at that time is stretched now by 2,500 times, that's what it looks like. Or you can also look at it as it is, 2,500 can also be look at, looked at as the, the, the size of the universe as it is today, it's 13.7 billion years. When I'm talking about H or when I'm talking about Z equal to 2,500, the size of the universe was 1 by 2,500 approximately of what size it was today. So that is what the universe, when it cooled down from a very hot Big Bang to about the temperatures in which helium can form, form around the, the time. And then you will find that, just let me go back, and then it, it ended the recombination of hydrogen. Today we know that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. And that's why hydrogen atoms are very, very important in the study of the universe. Well, that means the universe was completely ionized. And then as it expanded and cooled, it became, the recombination took place and it became neutral. But eventually, the neutral universe, after which became neutral after the universe cooled down, due to the radiation coming from the first stars which were born, eventually gets reionized again by the first sources of radiation that appear in the universe. So that's the point. That is the epoch that we are trying to study. So I, I just said that the very early universe was completely ionized. As the universe expanded and cooled, hydrogen and helium atoms were formed. And the, when the hydrogen and helium atoms were formed, the entire universe almost became neutral. But that was the time around which the first stars or nascent nice galaxies were formed in the universe. The radiation that was coming from those stars reionized the universe. So this is known as epoch of reionization. This is known as epoch of recombination. That is the first primordial recombination. And somewhere between epoch of recombination and reionization, the first stars were born. You can see here the, the first stars were born about 400 million years after the universe. The afterglow light that you see is about 400,000 years. That is, so therefore, what I was saying was, 
that look at that the universe began with a big bang and we have 13.7 billion years since the evolution is the, the universe has evolved i showed you a picture of the cosmic microwave background which is the pattern that we had seen around 400000 years whereas the first stars were born around so i was saying that the universe began with a big bang and we are 13.7 billion years uh, uh, you know we have evolved and the picture that you see here where i'm pointing it out to the arrow is the picture of the cosmic microwave background that i showed you which is about uh, you know 400000 years old after the big bang and then we had uh, dark ages in between where there was nothing much from the universe came and then the first stars were formed in about 400 million years and these objects or the intense radiation coming from these stars reionize the universe which had become neutral by that time that's why it had become opaque too so you find that the experiment that we are doing is to look at the universe how the, the environment of the intergalactic medium or the environment of the universe in something like 50 million years to about 400 million years and this is the picture that you have seen of the cosmic microwave background when the universe was only 400000 years old so that's what we are trying to do as i said there are not many people who have been able to see of course people are building very expensive telescopes one in the western australian desert and also one in the square kilometer array which is uh, two telescopes which are one is built in south africa the other built, uh, is also built in western australia very very remote areas of the universe of our universe on the earth so that we are away from any man made interference i'll come back to that a little later so that's what we are looking at and then how are we looking at this what we are looking at is we use what is known as the 21 cm cosmology what is this 21 cm cosmology you know you have heard of hydrogen atom emits a series of radiation you know bomber lines you know lyman alpha you know about the passion series a whole lot of them is well known to you but what became prominent after the radio astronomy was discovered is that a hydrogen atom in its ground state has a pi structure that is when the proton and electron their magnets are aligned or misaligned a photon of radio wave at 1.4 gigahertz or 21 cm wavelength is emitted so the hydrogen atoms which are there when the first light of or the, when the, when the first stars were born around the dark ages was complete and the first stars were born cosmic dawn was happening you will find that they are emitting this 1.4 gigahertz or 21 cm that's why the word 21 cm and then why these radio waves from the gas in the universe from the dark ages before the star and galaxies were made and during the cosmic dawn as the first stars transform the gas which were emitted at 21 cm get stretched as they come to us and we receive them at longer wavelengths or at lower frequencies we receive them between 30 and 200 megahertz today who does not know about fm radio if everybody i mean if it was a, an open uh, class i would have always asked which is your favorite radio station everybody will give me different kinds of answers oh sir there is fm 91.1 then somebody says no sir it's mirchi and so many other stations and that is about 100 megahertz which is 3 meters in wavelength so this radiation from the hydrogen atoms which were surrounding the first stars which were formed in the universe come to us between 30 and 200 megahertz and that's and they emit something like a radiation or absorption of the background radiation only to the extent of 100 millikelvin so we are talking about 3 kelvin to 3 millikelvin each is about one part in thousand so this is already only about uh, the, the, there is three kelvin to 3 millikelvin this is about 330 times more than that so we are talking about 30 by 1000 times stronger signal a very very weak signal i use the word strong but it's very very weak signal i'll show you that this is much weaker than what it is in one minute so why uh, it's weaker is i told you that the sun is about 6000 degrees 
it's a thermal body if he's emitting in radio uh, he's emitting in optical therefore radio waves are not so much part of why there are radio emissions also from the sun i don't want to confuse you but the dominant radiation comes from our own milky way and it is of the order of 1000 degrees so we are talking about we are looking at the sky we look at the galaxy and then which is about 1000 degrees up, i assume it to be that's called foreground and then we have this 21 cm radiation now becoming very stretched in the 3200 megahertz like coming like an fm radio to us for all of us astronomers that is the fm radio which tells us how the universe was and that is only about 100 millikelvin so you can see it is 10 to the power of 4 times weaker than the signal that we are receiving that means we are looking for a pin in the haystack so that is the sensitivity of the experiment that we are performing that's why the problem this for what we have done at roman institute we have designed antennas built deployed them at the roman research institute we have built very precise radios to look at this fm waves which are coming not they are not fm waves the radio waves which are coming from 30 to 200 megahertz very close to the frequency of operation of this fm radio and uh this is uh this is like a a partially silvered mirror uh, in the in at the uh, at the fm wave uh, at the fm radio waves and we have two antennas we are trying to measure and trying to see what is common to both of them and trying to grab the hydrogen atoms the signal coming from the hydrogen atoms in the early universe and this is once again an experiment done in the goribidno radio station goribidno uh, field station of the roman research institute what is the importance of all this that i'm talking to you about that so weak a signal means our radio telescopes need to be deployed in places that are quiet at radio frequencies the man made radio interference is a tremendous impediment to this so we have really gone looking for places to look for where the human intervention is very low so we went to ladakh and went to 4500 meters above the sea level and we hope this is where you see a, you see a picture of ladakh here and then you see a picture of uh, two of us installing our uh, 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 an antenna and an entire receiver system you are not seeing the entire receiver system i have only shown you this antenna so look at the the excitement when you want to look at this radiation coming from the hydrogen atoms which are so weak compared to the, our own galaxy we have to go so far but in addition we have to be away from any man made radio interference so we went to ladakh so look at this this is a beautiful sky i would have never seen this kind of a sky in bangalore when you go to ladakh and stay there at 4200 meters above the sea level and it's the desert the the night sky is beautiful this is not a picture taken from anyone else this is a picture that one of my colleague from the hanley observatory in 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 uh, hanley took it you can see this is the milky way and this is the tent and you see this huddled in the tent in the cold or or our me and my colleagues you can see me here uh, almost covered with lots of coats and caps and things like that and you would never see uh, exactly but that's the picture that you can see so look at the adventure of doing astronomy look at the adventure of doing cosmology at this so look at where all we went we went to leh and from leh we went to sumurari a lake that's why i said we did adventures on water and then we went to a place called hanle where the indian institute of astrophysics in bangalore has an observatory and then we went to very close to pangog lake to carry out those our experiments simply because they are very remote areas and then we have man made interference was low but of course we were hit i mean i don't want to go into and talk to you about what's happening today in pangog lake you know that this is very close to the border with neighboring countries and there is a lot of military activities around these places so we were also hit by a lot of uh, communication that takes place in the military things and therefore we could not successfully carry out our experiments but we did improvise our instruments to a large extent by taking them to these remote places where the man made interference was very low only when the foreground interference is low you can measure the sensitivity of your instrument you will find that going to these places was very exciting in one second i will show you now a video of what happened when we were there in somorari lake yes sir yes. 
the amount of dust? Who holds? Go back right uh, this is not just a movie taken from someone else but it was taken by us when we were doing the experiment and here you saw the kind of a dust storm that you get in a, a in a in a place like ladakh and even even not just uh, i didn't have the picture unfortunately at the end of the dust storm when we looked back this is you are seeing the steering wheel in this picture when we looked back our windscreen at the back the the, the back door of the uh, the car was shattered by the stones that were hurled at our car luckily we escaped the stones but the car glass was broken and we had to come back from sumurari lake to lay to get our thing uh, uh, fixed so that's the kind of excitement so people have all we have also built a radio telescope jointly with australia and uh, uh, universities in australia and universities in us particularly harvard and mit a, a telescope in the western australian outback and this was the first experiments for detecting these by done by our director ravi subramania from these places and then we also went to he said look why go to so far off places are there very close by places to bangalore which could be less interference so we did go to a, a place called timbuktu which is about uh, 100 150 kilometers from bangalore and we observed we were able to observe fortunately beyond the fm band the fm band is around 90 to 110 megahertz so we were able to measure from 110 to 200 megahertz and then we were able to rule out from our measurements we were able to measure out 27 of the 270 possible histories that the scientists had predicted what i mean by that is the hydrogen atom in its when it was undergoing a transition from the two states that i was describing to you we were able to understand by our radio and weaving through all the interference that came and taking away and modeling out the foreground coming from the galaxies we were able to show that uh, out of uh, 20 260 or so possible scenarios in which the ionization can take place that we ruled out about 27 possibilities about 10% of the possibilities that is the kind of difficulty in doing this experiments while we were doing all these experiments somebody from uh, arizona state university they built a, a very simple instrument like ours also a blade antenna covering the frequency band from 50 to 100 megahertz and they deployed it in a radio quiet western australia and they found a signal which was 500 millikelvin deep they saw what is twice than what of the theory expects and the whole world is trying to understand look where can we our experiment is being done very intensely to either uh, either you know uh, say that these observations are indeed correct or no we don't find these kinds of signals in our observation that's what i told you the excitement of doing astronomy in the forefront of what's happening today is that we are there trying to either uh, say hey look we also see the signal or not of course we were not the first ones to see the signal but people still today do not believe that this signal is true because it is twice the amount of what is expected from theories so people are looking at us to say look please do tell us do you also this is see this uh, signal so that's what we are trying to do the, our entire team is trying to do and that's why probing reionization of the universe using signal from hydrogen was attempted then we found that it may be possible that instead of going to a ladakh or a lay if we can go to somewhere on the water then we may be able to get better response from the antenna more signal from the hydrogen atoms which are emitted and also we may be able to find a remote lake somewhat closer to the uh, the southern peninsula and also where it is not so dusty or so difficult to do the experiment that's why from ground in lay we went to a water 
and we went to, this is an experiment we did, we went to the Chimale, Chimale, very close to the backwaters of Sharavati. I don't have those pictures, unfortunately, to show you. Here is a, a small picture. Now we have made an antenna on a boat, and we have allowed it to style on water, and we have carried out the experiment on water. And our team, consisting of all those people that you saw, are intensely, during the entire uh, coronavirus pandemic, we are sitting in front of our computers, the students, particularly one in Canada, one in Australia, who went from RRI to do the further studies. They, our director Ravi, and all of us, the engineers, are looking around at the data and trying to understand what we see. Well, maybe uh, sometime next time, when we are all out of this pandemic, I will come and share with you what are the results of the experiments that we have done in water. But I kept telling you that what is the biggest problem? There are two kinds of problems to do these kind of experiments to study the environment of in the galaxies, or the, sorry, the environment in the universe when the first stars were born. One is the signal itself is very, very weak and it is embedded in galaxy signal, which is 10 to the power of 4 to 10 to the power of 5 times larger. Whereas the other one is the man made interference. The only place on the Earth where there is no man-made interference is on the other side of the moon. So we are trying to put up our antenna. We have made a proposal to ISRO and we are trying to go to the other side of the antenna, shielded from the sun and the earth. And we are trying to ask the question, can we conduct the experiment here to look at the signal emitted from hydrogen atoms from the early universe? I think I will, this is the kind of developments that we are talking about. It will, uh, the, the, uh, the, these two, the, uh, the only place where there are no FM or TV signals and no ionosphere. I don't want to go into the details of ionosphere where there are no ionosphere. So we want to go to the other side of the moon and we want to conduct this experiment. So friends, that's what I told you. I, this is, I wanted to make it as a celebration of science wherein I explained to you all that what cosmology is about and then came to explain to you what is the present thinking and understanding of the universe, its birth and its evolution till today, and what's the specific experiment that Raman Institute and my colleagues are doing to study the environment of the first stars that were born, the kind of experiments, very, very sensitive antennas and receivers that we have built, and how we have already deployed it on land in very remote areas on the Earth, like Ladakh and Bangkok Lake and all around it, and then on water bodies, and then we have made a proposal to go to space. So that's what I meant by adventures in cosmology from ground, water, and space. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. It looks like I've taken about 50 minutes. Thank you very much for your patient hearing.